Neil Howe is a historian and consultant, a California native, graduate of Berkeley and Yale, and the author of over a dozen books. Perhaps most importantly, though, he is a baby boomer. With the late William Strauss, Howe wondered why boomers were so different from their GI elders. In the late 1980s, they developed an intricate yet broad theory of generational change. Their model has been very influential, inspiring figures from Al Gore to Glenn Beck and Steve Bannon. Neil Howe joins us on Liberty Chronicles to talk cycles, generations, and the myth-making business of history. This is Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. Uh, to start us off, is are there any important personal biographical details that have gone into informing your work? Religious affiliations, political affiliations, some kind of cultural identity? Uh, the answer is no. Um, I would say the one challenge uh, that I faced is basically um, uh, kind of shedding the affiliations that people project upon me. <laughs> mm, okay. Which has often happened, you know. Um, you know, when when um, when generations first came out, and I would say in the early years, when you know people associated, you know, Bill and and me with the millennial brand, quote unquote. Uh, I think we had a lot of people who assumed that we must be Democrats, sort of on the left. You know, uh, we were talking about this. Uh, this brand new, optimistic, community-oriented generation that would probably vote more toward the for the Democratic Party, kind of the ethos of the Democratic Party, which indeed was a pretty good uh, read. I mean, that was a good read because that's ultimately how they did vote, right? By the time they started voting after the year 2000, so that was something originally, and then obviously more recently, uh, with the you know the advent of the Trump administration and the book The Fourth Turning and Steve Bannon, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> people have applied sort of the opposite. You know, yeah. I'm some raving you know right wing populist, and uh, you know I'm the mastermind behind all of that. And so, so a lot of it has been. Uh, you know, I would say our books are a little bit of a, a kind of a Rorschach test for uh, the people who read them. Uh, they assume, you know, they sometimes assume. Oh my gosh. He's speaking to me. He's, you know, he's, he must sympathize with what I'm thinking. I mean, that tends to be one of the problems that libertarians or Austrians have with trying to model historical events that you, pro- you end up projecting onto it whatever you like to see or whatever story that you feel like telling. And, you know, it's interesting that people then read your, your book, which is an attempt to model historical change. Uh, and then, you know, end up doing the exact same thing with themselves. Well, partly, too, it's that... Um, and this is something we probably in in all of our books we discuss most in the fourth turning. But there is a penchant among particularly Western thinkers, and particularly in more recent centuries, for linear interpretations of social change. You know, all history is tending toward X. You know, with this Francis Fukuyama. You know, it's kind of liberal democracy and the fading of nation states around the world was popular in the 1990s or whether it's Marxism or whether it's uh, some sort of social utopianism or whatever it is. And, and this is something that we got from, you know, the great monotheisms, that history is linear. It starts in a particular place mm-hmm. and it ends at a particular place. And that ending is where we're all headed. Um, and we really ultimately have no choice about it. Um, and and so that gets – that generates tremendous amount of – you know, uh, uh, argument and dispute because, my gosh, that's where we're going to all end up. Mm -hmm. I hope it's a place I like, you know. Um, And, you know, our – uh, the, the the kind of the gloss or the or the layer that we put on it is is something a bit more cyclical. And uh, that ends up either – that ends up often disappointing people. Well, you know, it – so it's not going to end up at one place for all time. You know, I I do feel uncomfortable with the idea that we'll be going backward at some point, right? Back down the, the, you know, uh, cyclical cyclical curve. But then I 
thought to myself, well, a cycle is not a circle, right? The starting point is not the same as the end point. Uh, if, if, historic, if history is circular, then that's a very big problem. We're never going to improve in the end, right? We're right back to where we start. But a cycle is not necessarily, you know, shaped the same. It doesn't have the same yeah, destination. Exactly. That's why now, if if we lived in the ancient world, um, uh, uh, the observation that that all life is circular, history is circular, literally, uh, was was uttered all the time. I mean, that seemed to be a truism in the ancient world. This is why history did not uh, interest Plato. You know, history just was meaningless repetition. Mm -hmm. uh, you studied the forms, you know. Uh, history wasn't going to change anything. Uh, what happened down here was just sort of these idiots, you know, running from, you know, democracy to oligarchy to, 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 to tyranny back. And, you know, it, it, there was no interest in it. There, you, you weren't going to find out anything more about human destiny. Mm -hmm. So I think... That that's when I talk about modernity. Uh, again, with the rise of, of not only monotheisms, but I think an extra kind of afterburner was given with the rise of Protestantism, which gave a whole new urgency to the end times. And you know, and then obviously with 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 science, interestingly, science kind of arose after that. But you know, science also makes us think of evolution happening in a certain direction. But this becomes a very popular paradigm thinking in the West, and so. I often tell people, look, if you want to think about it that way, there are obviously things that change secularly. Our technology gets better, you know. Um, you know, we we tend to live longer. I mean, you can you know you can point out a number of things where life gets uh, ever better over time, or possibly, depending on your point of view, gets ever worse <laughs> over time. But you can point out linear trends. So if you want to think about it as a cycle. You can, um, you know, a, a spiral maybe right. is, is, yeah. is maybe the, a, a corkscrew shape trend. <laughs> which, so we don't, you know, we're not we're not exclusive. We don't mean to think that you can't uh, you can't find a lot of ways of interpreting history uh, in historical trends in in a large sense. Uh, we just have one dynamic that we think especially important and intriguing um, that we have focused on. Okay. Now let's let's flesh that out um, because you specifically apply your concept of cyclical history. That's hard to say. Cyclical history to Anglo-American history in the early modern and and the modern period. Um, could you could you break down that model for us and tell us exactly what does produce change? In, in yeah. Your let, mind? let me let me just preface that maybe by saying that that Bill and I, when we started writing about this, I, I think it is important. You asked me about kind of biographical considerations and so on. I think it is important to understand we did not set out to write about cycles in history. That was never our object when we started. Um, we were really interested in generational change. Uh, we're particularly interested in what kind of endowments different generations leave behind for future generations and and why different generations and we, we've seen this in our own life, particularly with you know our own membership as as part of the boomer generation and and being so different from the GI generation that won World War II and so forth. Our, everything about our generational experience was so different. You know, they were, um, you know, founding families and building battleships and boomers are keeping their lives on hold and going to Woodstock and, and just had a totally different way of looking at the world, right? Some, something that uh, later we forgot a little bit, but there was an enormous generation gap, as we like to say, you know, back in the late 60s and early 70s. And I think everyone alive at the time was very aware that different generations thought just very differently about the world. So our initial agenda was to figure out um, how this happens, how has it happened earlier in American history, to go back and look at historically at that phenomenon of different generations seeing the world differently because they're shaped differently in time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found as we look back in history is, is yes, there's always been a very strong generational consciousness. It goes all the way back to the founding of this country. We think it actually is... is uh, um, is true as well in many other modern societies around the world. 
And then, and then it was only at the last uh, uh, further investigation that we see that there's actually a certain cyclical element to these changes. Now, there's not only a generations all different, they seem to be different in a way that um, – in, in, a, in a recognizable pattern. Certain kinds of generations always follow other kinds of generations. And only lastly did we connect that to history itself. Obviously, since generations shape history young, generations as they grow older, as adults and leaders uh, themselves shape history, right? So it's, so it's a circle. And so that was the last sort of um, realization or phase we went through. Mm -hmm. and, and indeed, our first book, which came out in 1991, was called Generations, A History of America's Future. It had a little bit of implicit pattern making in it, but it was primarily a history of America told as a sequence of generational biographies. The, the, the overwhelming point was not cyclical. The overwhelming point was just to talk about these different kinds of experiences. Um, later on in the book we did in 1997, The Fourth Turning, uh, the cycle became much more in the foreground uh, and looking at cycle theories, the history of cycle theories, and, and then looking at generations as a driver for that. So then you would say that your ideas are applicable outside of Anglo-American history. It's not something peculiar to the culture started here in North America. No, and, I, and ironically, this is sort of a little bit the paradox, but it's actually societies which are most intent upon the applying linear history are actually most susceptible to these kinds of cycles. That's what makes it sort of fascinating to us. Why do you think that might be? Well, I think it's because Modernity gives generations the hubris or the power and the confidence to actually change institutions in their own image, right? So if you're in a, if you're in a pre-modern society, everything is prescribed. So whatever happens, you're not going to have the presumption of actually changing the institutions just because, well, you, you know, you saw life differently. No, no. You're always, you know, very observant of what has been handed down. You will follow that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're more of a modern mindset, um, you, your particular point of view, having been shaped uniquely by some big event like the French Revolution or industrialization or something that you went through, you think, no, no, we need to change these institutions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that you change them then shapes the experience for the next generation differently and you get much more of this push and pull through time. Um, anyway, this is, this is why and, – and I think – even in the ancient world, I think generational phenomena are observable. Um, you know, ancient Greece between the fifth and third century would be a wonderful time to examine generational change. You know, from uh, uh, from from the Battle of Marathon through Socrates through you know uh, Alexander the Great. So it was a wonderful panorama generational change. Uh, the mid to late Republic and on into the early Empire and the Roman. Uh, you know, history uh, is a wonderful place to examine generation change. It does occur when events in history actually change rapidly, and you do have a sense of, um, of uh, political civic events changing everyone in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is not the norm in, in pre-modern um, in the pre-modern environment. Yeah, I, I presume that also you would want to adjust some parts of the model, right? If you were going to, let's say. Uh, write your next book on ancient Rome. Uh, you have, would you have different archetypes, or do you think that the archetypes you see in American history would translate pretty well to other cultures that are experiencing this cyclical pattern? I think I think the archetypes would be the same. Absolutely. In fact, you know the archetypes which uh, come from you know everyone's familiar with Myers Briggs and all the other. These tend to be powers of two. You know, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so forth. Uh, these were these originally come from you know Hippocrates and Galen. These are ancient. You know the the the, the four humors and the four temperaments. These all go back to the ancient world. The, there is nothing new about fundamental archetypes. The only difference is is that instead of talking about people at any one given time as belonging to different archetypes, we talk about generations across time belonging to different archetypes, which is a new twist on the concept. So I'm wondering how much of the cyclical nature of history is dependent on biology. Is, is it based mainly on the, the average lifespan? 
if that were to change, would that substantially change the shape that history takes over time? It would, it would certainly change the periodicity. There's no question about that. It, um, I think what's, what's, what's interesting about what drives the kind of cyclical nature of social trends as we see it is that, is that you know, people are, are, are shaped young in, in childhood and, and their youth and coming of age experiences. And then, of course, as they're older, then they shape history as leaders and parents. And mm -hmm. what's, what's interesting about that is that, is that, um, is that there is a specific time period. Um, in, in most societies, there's a given amount of time, both socially and biologically, before you are deemed an adult mm -hmm. uh, and able to live a, a, a separate life a uh, life you recognized as someone able to make your own independent decisions and make your own choices as a man or a woman. And then later on, about the same period later, about 20 years or so, to be deemed to be fit for a leadership phase of life. And and what's interesting about that is that, you know, so many cycle theories uh, or so many people who, who have talked very convincingly about, you know, cycles of drug use in America, cycles of... Uh, of uh, of uh, you know changing trends in, in um, um, uh, family function or dysfunction, um, uh, cycles of uh, of uh, political realignment, or you know the long wave in the economy, or uh, cycles of immigration, and and so all of these cycles, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that is that it's often very difficult to understand? Okay, it's a very interesting, and it looks like there's a clear argument or it looks observable, right, in some respects. But how can we understand the periodicity? Why is it 40 or 80 years? Why isn't it all happen in two years? Or why doesn't it take 500 years? You know what I mean? In other words, what governs the cycle? Well, this is sort of what's interesting about looking at generations, is that generations is a natural governor of the timing. And I think one of the things you see in the fourth turning where we talk about all these cycles is that we think that these things are a sort of, you know, these, these are all good and, and many of them valid. We think that kind of the master governor is generational experience because it has a timing. That is to say, one generation style becomes dominant, uh, it becomes so dominant, it becomes dysfunctional. Other generations have to rediscover the what we might call the missing archetype, or right, what is suppressed, and bring that to life, and 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 that takes a certain amount of time, which can be biologically defined. So the answer to your question is yes. If we all live like mice, <laughs> right, yeah. and and it was all over, you know, uh, uh, from 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 grandchild to grandparent, and. Uh, in, in, in 10 years, um, we would uh, um, uh, we would have definitely a different kind of a different kind of cycle. Could you give us an example of a set of turnings and a set of archetypes and the kind of narrative that you ascribe to it in your books? Kind of a basic uh, schemata we lay out in the fourth turning is that is that we see a a, a long cycle of, of sort of overall social and political and civic life. Uh, cultural life uh, lasting about the length of a long human life, right? Which is about um, um, 80 years or so, uh, maybe 80 to 85 years, something like that in, in American history. And that, and that this is broken down into four periods or what we call turnings, each about the length of a generation, about 20 years, 22 years, something like that. And indeed, in American history, we actually, there's, a, there's a, actually a, 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 a whole... Uh, field in, in anthropology which talks about uh, 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 revitalization movements. Actually, uh, Anthony Wallace is the great source here, but talking about awakenings as something that happens in every culture, right? And But we've had them in America, and we call them, you know, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the third, and many historians call the, the late 60s and 70s America's fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on when you, you want to start your count with with uh, you know John Winthrop in the in the in the 17th century, or with Jonathan Edwards in the in the middle of the 18th century, but in any case, that's also interesting, right? That we have certain sequence there, and that formed the kind of the the structure for the sorts of turnings we look at. Namely, a a a first turning would be a a post crisis era, which is usually characterized by. Um, um, uh, 
uh, high degree of, of institutional trust, strong institutions, a relatively constrained domain for individualism, both sort of culturally and socially. There's not a lot of stress laid upon being an individual. is a heavy influence on conformity. A little bit of a band the wagons, you know, around the around these things that we've just defended. Uh, and that's what we call a first turning. And a good example of that would have been the American high after World War II, sort of that you think of the presidencies of of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy as being sort of that era, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and by the way, each of these eras has a certain generational location, right? That's the era in which boomers were children, the silent generation was coming of age into adulthood, and the GI generation, the greatest generation, was entering leadership positions, you know, in governors and governorships and state houses and, you know, along with Kennedy and, and, and on into the presidency ultimately toward the end of it. Um, the, that's the first turning. The second turning is what we call an awakening, uh, as just mentioned. And this is a period when, when uh, people uh, suddenly uh, reject all the um, social conformity, uh, the uh, uh, social control, uh, the kind of political inhibition, civic inhibition of, of, the, of the previous uh, first turning and rebel against it, trying to find a new sense of authenticity, individualism, uh, room, room for the individual, seed time for libertarianism, I might say. And this is, this is when boomers were coming of age. And, I, and I, you know, I would just add here that I think boomers today are among the most. You, th- you think about today's elder generation you know, in, of, of sort of the, 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 the gray champions of libertarianism today are heavy among boomers. Um, and they came of age during this period. Uh, but uh, this is characteristic. And it started in, mainly in the culture on college campuses during the mid-60s. Uh, it ended up in economics in the late 70s, early 80s with tax revolts and ultimately the election of Ronald Reagan. But whether it's in the culture, which was mainly at that time on the left, or in the economy, which is mainly at that time on the right, uh, it was always in the direction of liberation from all of this um, uh, social control. Mm-hmm. And this is a, this is a very constant uh, a, a theme of awakenings. By the way, the, the most recent awakening is largely secular, although it did have its born-again offshoots, certainly, um, uh, to say nothing of its Hare Krishna movement and everything else. Mm-hmm. But it was mainly secular. However, historically, this has been mainly in religion, and it's always been driven by the young, and it's always been predicated on salvation by faith, not works. Mm-hmm. Who believed in salvation by works? Their fathers, right, mm-hmm. who won all those wars. Who believes in faith? The new younger generation was born after the last great war. Mm -hmm. So this is always a great conversation. You know, back after the American Revolution, it was the anti-Masons versus the mate. The Masons were my fathers, right? The anti-Masons were the young generation. This is the loco foco movement. These were the these were the peers of uh, uh, well, maybe slightly younger than 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 Emerson, maybe more, you know, Thoreau, right, and his crowd. You know, ultimately, that was an incredible generation of, of, um, of, um, you know, feminists, poets, religion founders, uh, commune, you know, commune founders all over much of the Midwest and New England. Uh, incredible. It was probably one of the most tumultuous awakenings in American history. Unfolded, you know, in the late 1820s, 1830s, early 1840s. But, but okay, that's the second turning. The third turning is what you call an unraveling. And unraveling is sort of is is much the opposite of a first turning. So you think of a first turning as institutions are trusted and respected, individualism is suppressed, distrusted. Uh, the unraveling is much the opposite. Individualism is strong, institutions are weak, uh, and and discredited. So uh, you know we think of uh, we think of the uh, of the uh, you know. Late 1980s, 1990s, certainly uh, early 00s. We think of that as being an unraveling period, and of course, the generation coming of age during that period most recently was Generation X. Um, and and typically, this is in, in archetypal terms. This is what we often call a nomad archetype. You know, these were these are the throwaway children during the last awakening, uh, who were basically left alone and developed great strengths of resilience. Um, um, uh, uh, 
uh, kind of a hard scrabble quality of, of being able to do alone without anyone helping them. After all, they grew up not only not depending on institutions, but not even on their families or not really trusting anyone. So these are great genera- generations of individualists. And just as a, as a first turning uh, kind of accepts the wisdom of the recent crisis or the lessons of the recent crisis was we've all got to band together and keep safe, right? The, the third turning is the lessons of the recent awakening. We all have to atomize, mm-hmm. right, yeah. and enjoy things each on, on our own terms, not join. Joining was disaster. We learned that in the awakening. And ultimately, the great unravelings of history ultimately lead to the fourth turning, and that's the next crisis. This is an outer world crisis. This is when uh, we tear down institutions and rebuild them from scratch, often overnight, often suddenly. This is when public history begins to move very rapidly again. Um, and I think that when when you think of the kind of the two antipodes of the cycle, you know, awakenings are times when we rebuild our inner world of culture, values, religion, uh, literature, and so on. Uh, the the fourth turnings are eras when we rebuild our outer world of politics, uh, um, uh, economy, empire. I mean, those kinds of institutions more the more the the uh, the secular and material side. And very different generations coming of age. We, we call the generations coming of age during the awakenings to be the prophet archetype, mm-hmm. like boomers or like the transcendental generation during the, the 18, uh, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, the, the archetype that comes of age during the crisis is the hero archetype, much more oriented around secular goals, much more oriented around community and the need for community and reshaping everything they meet, technology or otherwise, around the need for community rather than, as was the case with boomers, around the need for individualism. And this is one sort of interesting segue, uh, you know, or, uh, possibly to talking about millennials and their need for community um, and what that means about what they want in politics, right, uh, which is kind of where many people go with that, you know, looking at the future. Now, speaking of the future, um, the fourth turning is sort of explicitly at least half prophecy, um, or at least that's how it's built. I, I wonder how strongly do you mean that? Do you see yourself and your work as is history or prophecy? And if prophecy, what do you mean by that? Why why make that word choice? The word choice was a bit provocative, almost intentionally so. I think I think history should be uh, prophetic uh, to some extent. Um, you know, I I talk to academic historians all the time. Um, I was one, sort of. I mean, I spent enough time in graduate school, uh, which I can think I call myself at least having contact with the academic community. One thing I notice is that historians in academia will um, resolutely protest. You know, history is, says nothing about the future. It has no predictive element at all. And if anyone ever claims that, they're a complete charlatan. In which case, you know, my I would argue um, then then you know why not be just like Plato and ask why would you ever study it? Why does it mean anything, right? If there is nothing you can extract from it, right? Uh, and anything useful can extract has to be something that can inform us about the future. Now, when I talk about turnings, I talk about social moods. I talk about likelihoods of things happening. I'm not forecasting events. This is a Nostradamus. And nor am I a, a, a historical determinist. I don't think everything has to come out in any particular way. I'm talking about tendencies, moods. Mm-hmm. I think it's very interesting when you talk to people um, about you know what, what the world is going to be like in the year, say, 2035 or 2040, people instantly think that this is like a science fiction you know, scenario. It could be anything, you know. And I say, that's crazy. We can know a lot about the year 2040. It's going to be all of us just older, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? And we already know a lot about all of us. And all I claim, and in fact, I spent a lot of, uh, you know, my own writing trying to discuss this, is trying to see, is there anything you can tell about people in their 30s when you really look at them, how they've been shaped, their attitudes and behaviors and so on, you can actually deduce something about how at age 30, you can already find out how they'll be at age 50. 
Yeah. If you can, we already know a lot about the world in 2035 or 2040. And uh, not only do we know how many they are, I mean, the science of demography is pretty advanced. But but I go beyond that and so say we already know something about their personality. We know something about where they're going to go. If you ask people, you know, will the next decade be more like the 60s or more like the 80s or more like the 90s, uh, to say that you have no idea, I just think you're tone deaf to history. You've got to be kidding. You have no idea. I mean, there's a lot we know about the 60s that was set up generationally, right? It was not just an accident that could have happened in any decade. And... And I think that is what I'm trying to bring back to looking at history, to understand that it is a, it's a, um, um, it, it can't be deduced necessarily analytically. It is a little bit of a tone poem, but it absolutely has causation. It has a certain uh, direction. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it, it has, a, it, it is a train of events or a train of, 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 of of um, mood shifts, which is broadly causal and which, which, uh, which does allow you to make um, certain c conclusions about where we're going. And, you know, I've been writing about this long enough to actually have a t track record at this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think I can speak with that with a little bit of authority. I mean, we came out with our first book in 1991. Uh, you know, when we, we – after Xers, you have to remember back then even Generation X had not been, yet been named. Uh, we just called them 13th generation. We called them 13ers. Uh, the next generation, um, that label did stick. We named millennials. We thought their first uh, – their first cohort would, would uh, be the high school class of 2000, so we thought that was a great name to give them. But we made some predictions about millennials, and, and what we did predict was that totally unlike the Xers that we were getting to know around 1991 and 1992, who I think impressed everyone by being um, you know, risk takers, sort of edgy in the culture, uh, certainly, certainly violent. We had almost the peaking of the crime rate. We had the crime rate peaked right around 1994. So this is certainly among risk taking was sort of propensity for you know personal confrontation and risk taking in that sense. Um, uh, alienated from family life, uh, generally collectively pessimistic about their future. All of these things we knew about, you know, this is back when people in their early 20s were all wearing black, you know, and, and grunge rock and, and gangster rap were still big, people still listening to Kurt Cobain. And so anyway, you just have to imagine what things were like. And what we predicted, we said, this next generation, we can see how differently they were being raised, right? All the baby on board signs, all the protective clothing, and all the all the bicycle helmets, and all the all the all the Lamaz books, and we everything about them was different. And we said we have seen this drama before. We had seen this play out before. Every time we had that dark to light change in nurture, we think we knew what happened. So we predicted that by the late '90s, early '00s. We would see a decline in personal risk taking. We'd see a decline in the crime rate. We would see um, um, parents much closer, kids much closer to their parents. Uh, we would see a lot more collective uh, optimism about the future. And we would see this desire for a new sense of community, which we didn't see at all among Xers. And I would say, arguably, statistically, you can see all of that having happened now among millennials. So that's why I say, you know, you can tell things, right? You can, you can look ahead. Uh, just even seeing a new generation emerge, you can make educated guesses about how they're going to come out. And I think if one looks back at our book, uh, I think I think our guesses are were pretty good um, in terms of events. Um, I think a better place to look at it in terms of looking forward was, was probably the, uh, our book, The Fourth Turning, where we talked about, you know, how the fourth turning would unfold. For libertarians, the individual is the fundamental unit of social analysis. You can't describe collectives as acting entities because they're simply composed of individuals who generate their own actions. They, it's always one person who applies means to fulfill whatever ends they have in mind. Right? right? Groups don't actually do anything. Only individuals do. What do you think about that? Do you think that's true? I think it all depends on your perspective. I think if you're, if you're a scientist or a social scientist, uh, you apply whatever tools of generalization work. 
you know, people often say, doesn't generations take away free choice? Right. You know, I get that all the time. And I say, that's, that's ridiculous. I said, you know, um, I know what you'll be doing um, four weeks from now at about 3 a.m. I bet you'll be in bed, you know? <laughs> You'll be sleeping, you know, yeah. high probability, you know, and, and it's a, so I take away your free choice. I've just made a prediction. Mm -hmm. Do you feel diminished by that? No, I think you probably don't. I think if it, yeah, like lots of other people, that's kind of how we, that's how we operate. And I could go down a huge list of those things. I could say that if you're a skier, you would probably be skiing maybe in December, January. You won't be skiing in July. Anyway. Marketers do that all the time. People who sell, anyone in companies, they know a lot about how you behave. They're not taking away from your free will. They're just observing. They're just looking at large numbers of people doing things together. I think when we, when we look at what, – what, what I find interesting is not that it's, it's – you know, people. It's not that they're blown away that people think, well, you know, you, know, you can be categorized as a member of a group. If you're rich or poor, depending on your race, your nationality, your region, you can probably say things probabilistically about you, right? How you speak, how you relate to other people. Do you send your parent to a nursing home or not? You know, that's strongly dependent on your ethnicity, which area of Europe you came from. Anyway, we know a lot about this. What's interesting to me is that generations are singled out for that, right? In other words, people who talk a lot about Blacks versus Hispanics versus whites, or talk about French versus Germans, talk about rich versus poor, or you know the educated, non-educated, make generalizations all the time. Then they come to me and say, "How can you generalize? You know about people born in a certain time?" And I'm just saying, I'm just using what works, just like you do, right? So I find that I am unfairly singled out, right, uh, for using a cohort period. Which, which arguably is, is actually a stronger determinant of many ways, in, you know, many social trends than necessarily a, a racial group or an income group or a regional group, uh, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, so I look at what works. And I'll tell you what's one thing that's really interesting about generations that other categories don't have. And this has always fascinated me. Generations are mortal. Mm, right. They're, they're born and they eventually die. They have a sense of finitude and a sense of urgency. A generation knows that there are certain things that they're ever going to do. They have to do it before it's over, right? That's something that no other category has. And it's also generations, I think, are so interesting to look at history precisely because of that timing. They are shaped in history. And they, on a very predictable time scale, they will be the leaders. They will make certain decisions in public life, which will instance a lot of other people, perhaps even in war, perhaps even, you know, huge events. Uh, and that will happen on a certain schedule. That gives it that interesting forecasting dimension. You know, if I know a lot about Hispanics or Californians or rich people, I don't know what that tells me in terms of looking forward time-wise. You know what I mean? There's nothing in that information that does anything in time. Generations are different. They do have a schedule. And just as, as a demographer, and I'm familiar as a demographer, you know, they, 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 people tell you all the time, uh, uh, and, and I, I, you know, I, I do standard demography all the time, and, and, uh, and I often tell people it's one of, the, one of the few things we really do know about the year 2060, that absent, you know, a, a global war or a Martian invasion, we know pretty accurately how many people are going to be around. Fertility rate doesn't change very much. And, you know, a lot of these people have already been born. And, you know, the migration rate, you know, it doesn't change fast. We can tell a lot about the shape of the population quantitatively in the year 2060. I just add that we also know through looking at uh, generational change and, and how cohorts are shaped, we also know a little bit something about the attitudes and behaviors of those who will be around in the year, you know, 2040 or 2060. And that's what fascinates me. It's the fact that generations have a timetable. That's what I find fascinating about it. Whatever you might think of Howe's brand of history or his model's validity, he has challenged us to think generationally. 
Each new generation has the ability to dramatically improve upon their world. The tragedy is that so few actually have. In my view, history is like purgatory. We learn its sad stories to burn away the sin and emerge better people. Purgatory has its uses, yes, but it is definitely not the final destination. When we have learned enough history, perhaps we will finally stop being so cruel to one another. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. To learn more about Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.